when I, when, I, when I wrote about redemption in the book of Yom Suf, I write about what I call Israel's redemption because when Israel rejected Yeshua as being Mashiach, as many people that are maybe not be aware of, it, they had to do it. There was no way Israel could believe that he was the Messiah at that time except for the remnant that were there. Had they believed that he was the Messiah and he had never been crucified, then we wouldn't be sitting here today because redemption had to come somehow and God had chosen our people, and I say our people because I am Jewish, both my mother and father are Jewish, uh, although as many people say, you don't look like a Jew. <laughs> You look at my grandfather, and you'll know where the Jewish side comes from. But, uh, but the thing is, is with the Jewish people, when God called Abraham, God put Abraham under a test. And the test that he put him under, a lot of people wonder, you know, because he takes his son, he tells him to take Isaac and take him up on the mountain that he would appoint, that he would show him. He says, I want you to offer your son as a sacrifice, your only son. Now, the Bible clearly says that God was testing Abraham, but really, you think about it, it's like, what kind of test is that? I never will forget, I was riding in a car, coming back, and there was a young man with me. He was only about 19 years old, and he wasn't a, a Christian. And I asked him, I said, how come you've never given your life to the Lord? I said, a young fellow like you, I said, you're at the prime of your life. It's a perfect time to, to know that Yeshua, that Jesus is your Lord. And I said, you haven't done it. He says, well, there's just some things that bother me in the Bible. And I said, such as? I said, just out of curiosity. He said, that story about Abraham. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. He said, here the guy is. God speaks to him and tells him, go up and kill his kid. He said, that is pretty weird. He said, now I know the story says God was testing him, he stayed his hand. He said, could you imagine what his son was thinking though the rest of his life? I ain't doing no trips alone with my dad no more, you know? And it was kind of funny to listen to him say that, but you know, if you think about the reality of it, you know, we know that Isaac undoubtedly knew somewhat what was happening because he carries the wood, he doesn't fight, he doesn't resist, he does everything that Jesus would do. He's willing to play that part although it doesn't seem easy, but he's still willing to, to do whatever he was commanded to do. Now, the thing is, though, is what was God doing with Abraham? God was trying to see if Abraham had the ability to do what God had called him to do. And that was to be, to, to, in other words, for his people. Come on in, come on in. Have a seat. We've got some room over here. God bless you. We just got started, so you, you're all right. We haven't even, haven't even read the scripture yet. We're going to go to Genesis 2, 8, 18. But the thing was, was God just wanted to see whether or not, not just Abraham, but would his people have the ability to offer up the greatest sacrifice that was going to come. That's when we say that Israel, we're a chosen people. We weren't chosen because we're better than somebody else. We were chosen because God was looking for a people that had the strength to be willing to do the unthinkable and to take the life of the very Son of God. That's what we were chosen for. The Bible says we're a priestly nation, a priestly people to offer sacrifices unto God. And so he knew that we would have never done it had we known what we were doing. That's why even Abraham, Abraham could not understand why he was doing this, but he was obedient to God's word. And neither could Israel ever understood. They didn't understand who this Jesus was. They, they knew that he was born among them. He was a Jew to them. He was, you know, his father. They knew Joseph. They knew Mary. You know, but that was all. But he was obedient nonetheless. And that's why Israel is a chosen people. They were chosen for that purpose, not because they were better than the Gentiles. You have to remember, I mean, Abraham and Sarah, one was a Hittite, one was an Amorite. You know, Slavic peoples, as we would say, are Arabic people of what we would see today. No different. But he believed God, and God called him out because of his faith, and that's where that kind of began. So let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 2. That's where we'll start at. <clears throat> In Jewish tradition, we always read the Torah. So on Shabbat, and so Shabbat Shalom to everyone because the sun has set. 
And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first read to you in Hebrew, and, uh, and, and then we'll read it in English. And so it says, Vayomer, and I don't pronounce God's divine name. I can tell you why, but anyway, Vayomer, we use Adonai instead of uh, his divine name. Vayomer Adonai Elohim, lotov hayot ha'adam lavado. What God is saying here is that God says, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now, we always think immediately that this is where God is going to create a, a wife for him. But I think it's much deeper than that. Let's take real quick, we're going to look at Psalm 22. And that will kind of set the, I guess the word would be precipice. Um, for what we're going to speak about. Oh, we got some more folks. We'll wait just a second. God bless you. John, I think these are the guys you're waiting on. Oh, you guys are okay. We need to know who you were when you come in there. <laughs> so, God bless everybody. Anyway, so in, if we go to Psalm 22, this is the, the famous psalm that we all read, uh, that, that many people know, where David actually is speaking the very words that happen on Calvary when, when Jesus is at the cross. And he says here, uh, and I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to skip through a little bit, but uh, verse 2, uh, Why art thou so far from helping me, from the words of my, my loud uh, complaint? Uh, let me read it from a King James, because I'm sure most people are using that, and I don't want to. I use a Hebrew Bible, and if I say it in a way that's kind of hard to understand, make it a little bit easier. Psalm 23 is a famous psalm that everybody normally knows that you learned in, as children. But Psalm 22, uh, oh my God, I cry in the day. Actually, let's go to verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and I'm not silent, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee. They trust in and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee. Now as you go on down th through this psalm here, he's going to get to a place here uh, where he talks about they pierced my hands and my feet. Um, let me drop down to verse 8. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him be delivered, him seeing uh, he delighted in him. But thou art uh, he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly, be not far from me, for trouble is near me, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They, ga they gaped upon me with their mouth as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and, uh, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the, in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shred, and my tongue cleaveth to, the, to my jaws. Thou, thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, and assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. In other words, he can, he's acting if he's so wounded that he can literally see his own ribs. Because we know that Yeshua was beaten so badly that you could literally see the bones of his body from the, the abuse that he suffered during, during the time that he was being, being tortured the way he was. So the point is, the, the main thing I wanted to bring out about Psalm 22 is that David sings this song as if these things were happening to him. But we know that David's hands and feet were never pierced. There's no biblical record for that. But he does everything that we see that is going to happen to, to Jesus, to Yeshua on the cross at Calvary. But the odd thing is, when I, when I take you to Genesis here and I read to you, and I know it sounds kind of odd at first when I talk about this, when God says, it is not good for the man to be alone, all the way through the entire Bible, all the stories, whether it be of Joseph, whether it be of David, uh, whether it be of Abraham, Isaac, 
all the way down through there, these stories uh, uh, that we read about in the Bible, they every one reflect Yeshua in some way. You know, I mean, we take the story of Joseph, the most popular one that everyone knows. Joseph reflects Jesus in nearly every way. He was spiritual. He was hated by his brethren. He was sold out for, I think it's 20 pieces of silver. Uh, Yeshua was sold out for 30. He was thrown into the pit, supposed to be dead, like Yeshua went into the grave. Uh, and he was taken down into captivity. He was falsely accused. He went to prison as a result of that. Uh, just over and over and over and over. And many of the things that I teach on that goes a lot deeper than what scholars talk about because I go into the aspects of when his brothers come back, why does he put, Joseph put his own cup in Benjamin's bag when Benjamin was not, he was not guilty of what happened to Joseph in the first place. Well, it was because Jesus was rejected at the communion table. That's what that cup represents. And not only was he rejected at the communion table, but there's another reason for that cup. Benjamin, though he was innocent then, would not be his children in the future, would not be innocent when Jesus came on the scene. His own children, the Benjamites, are going to cry out against Jesus. So it's foreshadowing, it's prophecy there. So everything, even the part that when they're on their way back and, and, and Joseph puts all their money back in their bag and, and, uh, and, and they're headed back home to their father because there's this great famine in the land and, and there's seven years of famine and they're headed back. Uh, and, and when they stop, they stop at the inn. In Hebrew it says Malon, which means hotel. And when, when one, of the, one of his brothers are going to feed, feed his ass there, his donkey, he opens up his bag and the, and the money is in the neck of the sack. Because see, when they went down to Egypt, they didn't know that was Joseph. Same thing with Jesus. When Jesus came on the scene, they never, the Jews didn't know that he was indeed their brother. So they, they take and he opens up the bag and the money's in the bag and he gets scared. The first thing he remembers is what happened to Joseph. He remembered the evils that he had done. Why, is the, why does this happen at this particular place? See, all these stories are hidden and tied together because God is going to open the eyes of the Jews in the day we're living in now, and they're going to see where they missed everything. And so for the Jewish people, it's important for us to know these things because the Bible clearly says, oh, I'll get lost, let me, I don't want to go back there yet. But anyway, let me tell you why, though. The first place Jesus was ever rejected was when he was in the womb of his mother. And Joseph tried to find her a place to have this child, and he goes to a hotel, and they said, there's no room for you. That's why Joseph, when his brothers are going back, they open their sack at a hotel. And the funny thing is, is of course the donkey's carrying the sack and everything. Why? Because Jesus had to be born in a stable. So God bless you, brother. I think there's seating over, over on this side over here. Or there's a chair here if you want to grab over on this side. So the, the interesting thing here is that every story and everything you can imagine in every possible way is a reflection of who Jesus is. And so when we begin to look, even like with David, I bring out the 22nd Psalm. How could David sing this? David's whole entire life, he played out Jesus all the way through. Absalom, his son. In Hebrew, we call him Avshalom, or Avishalom, which literally means my father is peace. And he takes, and when David is king and everything, Absalom doesn't truly recognize that his father is king, so he works on a coup to overthrow his father. And then he becomes the king. And of course, David could have rebelled. God bless you. It's okay, come on in. So we, we have another seat here if you want to sit there or, or however you want to do. So, well, we're, we're good to go up here. So thank you. So anyway, though, David is... Everything about his life, when, 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 especially in the book of Samuel. So if you want to, to look this up later, when you look at the story of David, when you go to the book of Samuel, this is where you start seeing the whole life of, of Yeshua played out. 
And it's not the part of the warrior part, which that's, the, that, that's part two. That's actually things that are going to be fulfilled more in uh, the events that are coming up. But when we see the part where Absalom, his brother, overthrows his father, this is when you start seeing the type of Israel. Absalom represents Israel 2,000 years ago, and he rallied the people. Absalom rallied the people around him, and, he, and he, he, he wooed them over to turn against his father. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did in the days of Yeshua. The Bible clearly says in the, in the Christian Bible that they would go around and they were working on the people to go against Jesus. You know, that's my father's side. That's what he was, a Pharisee. And so we see this, and, and so there's this hu huge coup against David and his men who were valiant warriors. They said to him, we can, we'll fight. You want to fight? We'll fight. Absalom's men were not warriors, but David's men were. It didn't matter if they were old or not. They were still warriors. It's kind of like Brother Rick. I want him on my side. <laughs> He's a tough old guy. So... But, you know, the thing is, is that's the way, that's, that's what it was there. When, when we begin to look at what happened with David, he takes, and, and the same thing with Yeshua, when, when they were coming to take Jesus away, what, what, did, what did Peter do? He takes is out his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. He's ready to fight. David's men said the same thing. They said, whatever you want to do, you want to put down the rebellion, we'll put it down. David said, no. He said, we're not going to do that. He said, there's, he said, there's not going to be bloodshed. Just like Jesus. And instead, he goes out, takes his people. They cross the Kidron Valley. They go up on the Mount of Olives, and he weeps over Jerusalem. Jesus did the same thing. He sat on the Mount of Olives. He weeps over Jerusalem. And he said, you know, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood. He said, but you would not. He said, your house is left to you desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. See, what house was he talking about? Now, we know, and figuratively, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. He wasn't talking about the temple. He was talking about their heart. He had come to bring the very life of God to restore the Holy Spirit back to the people, what had been lost in Genesis when the fall came. Adam and Eve, that's what we're going to go into tonight, is what was happening in the Garden of Eden. That's the redemption we're going to look at. All right? But he came back to restore that back. Now, but as David, like I said, he, he wept over him. He, he, as he leaves, as he goes out of there, who comes along? Shimei. Shimei's throwing rocks and stuff at him and his men and cursing them. And, and finally, David's one of his men said, should we let this dog's head stay on him? He said, my Lord. He said, let me, let him, let me kill him. David said, let him alone. He said, God told him to do that. Same thing happened with Jesus. They were spitting on him. His men wanted to kill him. They, Jesus said, let him alone. See, everything you see is there. Esther is another one. Vashti is a type of Israel. I was in Washington, D.C., sitting with one of Obama's own Secret Service agents one night. Christian man. Loved the Lord. And he goes like this. When I mentioned Vashti being a type of Israel, he says, there is no way Vashti is a type of Israel. He said, she just didn't want to be paraded before a bunch of drunk men. And right when he said that, the Holy Spirit come upon me. And I looked at him and I said, no, sir, you fail to know the word of God. I said, on the day of Pentecost, and the funny thing is, I didn't even know it. I didn't even know what I was going to say. It just come out of me. I said, on the day of Pentecost, there were all nations represented there, just like in the story of Esther. When the king there had invited all the different nations around and they were having their little thing with, and they were allowed to drink wine and stuff. I said on the day of Pentecost when all the nations were gathered and the Holy Spirit came down, they came out, they staggered around a bunch, like a bunch of drunk men and the children of Israel said, these men are full of new wine. And Peter stood up and said, it's not so. It's only the third hour of the day, but this is that what the prophet Joel spoke of. You see, there it was. Vashti was a type of that. She was a type of Israel. And when the king summoned her to come, when Jesus summoned, summoned Israel to come and partake of the Holy Ghost, they did not recognize that it was God in it. And they rejected it. They rejected the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is why their house is left desolate. The, the Holy Ghost was for them. But we have to remember, too, God had blinded Israel 
Because had he not blinded him, blinded them, they would have never crucified Yeshua. Had Israel's eyes been open and they'd known that this was the Son of God, they would have never laid a hand on him. Then there would be no redemption. He had to die. And that's what we're going to go into is why he had to die. So anyway, in the story of Esther, we see, though, that Vashti, she, by the way, he never divorced her. Some people think that Vashti was divorced. No. He only removed the crown from her head. And they give a better one. You know, if, to look for a, a woman that would be more true to him, which were, the, in this case here, Esther represents the Gentile believers that end up believing that Jesus is the Messiah. And, in fact, when I'm in Indianapolis here in the, uh, next weekend, I'll be speaking up there. The one thing that I'm going to be talking about there is about Esther. I'm going into a lot more detail there. Because, see, the thing is, is Esther, see, you are the type of Esther. You represent her. And when Israel, here's the funny thing. Who tells Esther that, that Israel is at the point of annihilation? She's a type of the bride of Yeshua. She's a type of the bride of Christ. And Esther is a type of the bride of Christ. A Jew comes and tells her, Mordecai, that if you don't take a stand for your people, they will perish. And this is what's so important with the Christian people today. Even though you recognize Yeshua to be Messiah, Esther became the queen. But it, would, it did her no good. On the point of death, she went before the king to cry out for Israel's life. And that's what you have to do. And this is what's happening right now in Israel today. Now understand, the secular side of Israel... God, God did the politics that we have over there, Shimon Perez, crooked guy, and all that, that's not, that's not real Israel. But those Orthodox Jews that can't stand the Christian people, those are the ones that he loves. Those are the ones that their eyes are blind so that you can still see. And Jesus' own words were, that they will be blind unto the, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now, Jesus says there's going to be a fullness. So there comes a time where the redemption that's opened up for the Gentiles, it'll be closed. And their eyes will come open. So your stand for Israel now is what's important. You know, and so anyway... Uh, all, like I said, all these stories. Look at, look at uh, Boaz and Ruth. Ruth, a Moabite, a Gentile woman. Naomi, her mother-in-law, a Jewish woman like the diaspora. She, they, they leave Israel because of the famine. Israel leaves because of the rejection of Yeshua. 2,000 years they were wandering. She leaves. She loses her husband, loses both of her sons. You know, four Jews go out, one comes back, kind of like the way it is today. About the number of Jews that come back is just about 25% of what actually went out. And, there, and, and the thing is, is when Boaz comes to her, who's a type of Christ, he says to her, it's been told everything to me that you've done to your mother-in-law. He's in love with her, but he takes notice her love for her mother-in-law. Now, I don't say that you have to be in love with Israel, but you, you, <laughs> you get the point, though. It's, it's important to God is what it is. You know? And even though they don't understand how important you are, the thing is, is you have your eyes open to be able to understand and see. Now we're going to look at the cost that it took to bring all this about. When we read here in Genesis to start with, we read in chapter 2, and God said, V'yomad Adonai Elohim, Lo tov, it's not good. And God said, it is not good, Chayot Chadam Levado, it is not good that the man is alone. If God has typed everything that we see in the Bible about Jesus to begin with, why, do we, why would we assume then in the book of Genesis at the beginning of creation, the first man 
and the first woman is any different? Can't be. When God says everything up until this point, as you read in Genesis, He creates the heavens and the earth. You know, Baoshit, et Hashemayim, et Haaretz. You know, He's talking about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Everything is good. And it's the morning and the evening and the first day, the second day, and everything is good. He creates man. Everything is good thus far. In fact, when He says He created a woman, He says it was very good. So I'm sorry about that, brothers. You're, you're good, but when He created her, she was very good. My wife likes to put emphasis on that one. So, all right. But God says here, it's not good for the man that, he's, that he is alone in everything. What I've seen in this story when God began to deal with me about Adam is Adam is also, again, another type of Christ. And what happens in this story here? When he said it was not good that he was alone, where was his wife to begin with? She was inside of him. When God started this whole program that He was doing, it's not that God is foolish. God knew everything that He was doing from, from, from the very day that things began. He knew that the fall was going to come. He knew that you were going to be here. He knew that your name, the number of the hairs on your head, everything. And just to give you a little, I just have to do one little sidetrack on the number of the hairs on your head. There's a precious sister named Anna, and she just went home to be with the Lord recently. When I met her, uh, we had a little business. We delivered pianos and organs, and I had picked up one out of North Carolina, and I brought it back to her. And I didn't know the lady or anything, but when I opened the door, I was late at night, about 9 o'clock at night, but they had to have it anyway. She's in her 70s at the time. When I opened the door, she just started petting my face, and she said, I have waited so long to see you. And honestly, I thought that maybe she'd been drinking a little bit too much wine that night, you know. I, I didn't know, you know, but she kept saying that. And she said, you're so beautiful, you know. And she invited me in, and then she started talking about the Lord. And, I mean, she was just spontaneous. And she was so in love with Jesus like I never saw before. She wasn't from America. She's from Europe. And she told me, I had to come to America to find Jesus. And she said, I'm so happy I did. She says, in my country, we didn't know nothing about him. And she says, and I came here. And she began to tell me, she says, you know, Steve, one day I was sitting on my bed and I heard a man walk into my house. I was not afraid. She said, but I was wide awake just sitting here thinking about the Lord Jesus. And she said, and this man walks into my room. She said, a handsome man. She said, dark hair. She says, olive complected. And he says, Anna, would you like to see where Jesus lives? And she said, I would like nothing better. And he took her by the hand. He said, I want you to close your eyes and open them. And when she did, she said, it was like she was up looking back over the earth. And she said, and for some reason, I looked down and I saw a woman on the earth and my attention went straight to her. And she said she had beautiful freckles on her face. And she said, I knew every freckle that was on her face. And the angel, without even me saying a word, looked at me and he says, and you wonder how he knows the hairs on their head, the number of the hairs on your head? He says, when you come here, it's not like being there. He says, let me show you where he lives. And so he asked her to close her eyes. She opened them again. She said, it was like on a place, looked like earth. And she said, when I was standing in this place, she said, but it was different. She said, as the leaves were putting, beating their leaves together, she said, they were all screaming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. She said, I looked down and the little rocks on the ground in a high-pitched voice were praising God. The mountains in a deep voice were praising God. She said, there was a beautiful waves rolling in and the waves were all playing a beautiful music hymn, and it's all in rhyme and all in perfect harmony. She said, I became so overwhelmed with love. She said, I began to worship Him. And she says, and when I began to worship Jesus, just being in this presence, she said, I heard a voice say, let everything keep still. Anna is worshiping me now. And she said, and everything went to silence. And she said, and I couldn't stop. I just kept worshiping Him. And she said, when I stopped, everything went back again. And she said, the angel told her when she was standing there, she said, he said to her, every time one of his children on earth worship him, that's what happens. He says, because you were put here on free moral agent, you can choose or not choose to worship him. He says, but when you choose to worship the Lord, he tells everything to keep still 
while he receives your worship. And I never met, well, I shouldn't say I never met, but the love that she had for the Lord Jesus was so incredible. Anyway, so when God said that it was not good for the man to be alone, he was displaying through Adam what God felt like. You see, because before the world ever began, God had us in His mind. We were in Him. What we would be was already in Him. Our lives, the eternal life, the eternal life that He is willing to give you was inside of Him. And He's only waited to give this to you. And so when He said, it is not good for the man to be alone. God knew something was wrong. But see, he already he knew. Adam didn't know what was going on, but God knew. Because see, when God does this, if you go back a little bit, and we, let's see what verse this is in. We're still in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to back up to verse 7. What God is saying here is that when he formed the man from the dust of the ground, Adam, that's what, where Adam gets his name, Adama, from the dust, from the dirt. He formed him from the ground, Mincha Adama, Ve'yipach, or ve'yipach, ve'yipach is God. The word e in there is for he, like he, he breathes. That's where God is breathing. He breathes into the very nostrils of Adam. Nishmat chayim. The chayim is God's own life. The word chay any of you ever see the little thing that Jews sometimes wear, or even Christians wear them? It's got the little chet and the yod on there, the word chai, which means life. But in this case here, God breathes into Adam chayim, which is more than one life. And it's God's life. And he breathes it into that one clay figure that's laying on the ground. In fact, for Jewish people, when Yeshua, after his resurrection, remember when he comes up to his apostles? And he breathes on them and he says, receive you the Holy Ghost. He's trying to get them to recognize who he is. He was the same one that breathed into Adam's nostrils. The same God. In fact, Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, truth and the life. What was, what, what, the word chai is life. What is the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden? See, if you read it in English, let me get that particular one to work. Do it from where you sit in King James. Um, I meant that's backwards, sorry. My Bible got run over by a car the other day, so it's a little bit beat up now. Okay, 2, 7. And the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden, it's not like the fruit trees where everybody goes and picks a fruit, but yet it is a fruit tree. There is fruit that could be had. But it was not one that you went and picked. It was a free gift of God. That's why when you read about salvation, it's a free gift of God. He gives it to you. And nowhere did Adam or Eve ever have to come and partake of this tree. God just gave it. In fact, you don't see any place in the Bible either where after Eve is taken from Adam, where God has to breathe in her nose the breath of life. She's already got it. She came from inside of Adam, filled with the Holy Ghost, so to speak. That's what the Chaim is. Now, John did this nice little drawing. He's a math professor, so forgive him. He's not an art professor, but he was kind enough to do this for me. When you read in Hebrew here, this is what God calls Adam. He's called Ish. It's Aleph Yod Shin, three letters, right? 
And he cheated. He knew what I was going to talk to you about, so he already knows. So he darkened in the Yod, the, the letter Yod, the middle name. All right? That's what God calls Adam. He doesn't call him Adam. He calls him Ish. And the funny thing is, the rabbis don't know why. They should, though. When he brings Eve out, he calls her Isha, Aleph Shin Hey. All right? Now, here's what's interesting. It's a compound word. Both of them are compound words. The Aleph and the Sheen, put it together, is Aish, which means fire. The Yod and the He is Yah, God's name. So what, was, what, were, what were they? They were the fire of God. That's what they were. You know, and you know how we, we read in the Bible, the Bible says they were naked and they didn't know it. They were clothed in the glory of God. It wasn't like you could walk around and see them naked. They were clothed in His glory. But when sin came in, He still called them this because it's what, they, what He created them to be. But how did they get this in them? It was when God breathed that breath of life into them. But then it says about Adam, he became a living soul. And when he talks about Adam in that regard, he talks about it in a singular. But when he breathes into Adam, he doesn't breathe into him to a singular. He breathes into him a plural form of the life of Almighty God inside of them. And that was just like we would call the Holy Ghost today. So no wonder why when you read about the, on the day of Pentecost and it said that every, over every one of them it was like tongues of fire. See? That's the fire. It was the Spirit of God that was inside of them. That's what gave them life was God's own life. But when the fall came, God could not allow mankind to receive of the Holy Ghost in a fallen state without redemption. So then He guarded the way of the tree of life. And he had to push them out of the garden. And so things begin to change. Now, Adam, though, as a type of Christ, when God said it is not good for the man to be alone, he no doubt, we don't read this, but he had to have been going through an agony. Something was bothering him because for God to say something's not good, something's not good. I mean, there is a problem. If everything else is perfect and Adam is there alone and God says this is not good, God sees a problem going on in the Garden of Eden. And God wanted to display what he was going through. And so he used Adam to do that. Because when God, in His mind, in His thinking, you were there, and He's longed to have a covenant relationship with you. That's why He says not one will be left out. He's not going to lose any. And the fact, the way God actually brings Eve into being, by the way, is the same way that Christ did it. What does God do? He takes and He puts... I keep thinking i got a pin on here because of this microphone. I keep looking for my glasses because that's normally where I hang them. Alright, let's look and see what He does. We're going to go to Genesis... Um, uh, chapter 2, verse 21. Ve'yapel Adonai Elohim, excuse me, Teradama. He puts him in God, and so God puts him into a deep sleep, El Adam. And then it says, and he slept. Now, in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, the very word that's used there is what we call a coma in medical terminology in Israel. God then opens up his side. Now, most people are taught that he takes a rib out. There's a lot of debate amongst he uh, Hebraic scholars, and I'm talking about Jewish Hebraic scholars, whether or not he actually took a rib out or if God just took his side from him and then taken from that side and created the woman's body itself. Now, you do have to remember, though, God actually creates Adam and Eve together before this particular part here when he says he created them. And it does say them in Hebrew. So they're, al they're already cr created. Now, by the way, this is going to shake the men that believe that they're the boss. 
God never made a woman to be subordinate to a man. Never. He created you equal. Just because you come from inside of him, actually where it says, he doesn't say he took you from a rib. He says he took you from me, uh, me'ish. Literally, that means God took you from the fire of Almighty God and brought you out. And God fashioned your body. In fact, that's one nice thing I like about the Orthodox Jews. They say that God took a deliberate, a, a deliberate creation of the woman far greater than what he did when he formed man's body. But he never created you less. Now, where that does come into play is in the fall itself, when God comes to, to Eve and he says to her, what have you done? And she said, the serpent beguiled me. And then he immediately turns to the serpent and he says, what have you done? And let me read that to you real quick. We'll do it in English to make it simple now. And it's important that we understand this because the whole purpose of redemption lays right in this. So when you go into... Uh, Still going backwards. They should have wrote English right to left. Okay. I think it's in chapter 3. Now, of course, this is... When we get into the argument of actually what happens here, the serpent is arguing... Uh, or the serpent is, is having the debate with the woman about whether or not she could eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil or not. And so this debate goes on and it's, it's a roaring little fire. And then, of course, later the rabbis all say, you know, one of the biggest things that she did wrong was that she was saying that God said and God never told her that. And my, my argument back with them is if, if she broke God's commandment by speaking when God didn't say something to her personally, God would have brought it up, but he never does. So that's just a fallacy. Nowhere does God ever hold her accountable for when, when she's making the argument. Let me just read to you so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, in Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall, eat, uh, shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of, of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of the, which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said, You shall not eat of, of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said uh, unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Now, a lot of rabbis think that God never told her that because they don't read that there. They didn't read it in the Bible because it does say that God had instructed Adam not to do anything. So they assumed that God never said anything to the woman. But had he, he had not had that relationship with her, God would have said something. God never gets on to her about that. Not one single time. So that's something that we've added to the text that doesn't exist. Okay? So he goes on to say like here, he says, uh, and, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, of course we know that she partakes, her husband partakes, their eyes come open, they realize that they're naked. Uh, and then as we go down, let's see here. God comes down to find out what's going on. We get down to verse 12, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. He passes the buck because he's concerned about what's going to happen. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above all of every beast of the field. And upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now here's where redemption comes in. This is what the important part is. So, and of course the rabbis argue again, and they say, well, a woman can't have a seed. Only the man has a seed. Well, God begs to differ with you. Because see, the thing is, it's not dealing with a natural seed. When the fall came in, there was something that went wrong. And what did Eve do? She only did one thing wrong. She tried to reason with the Word of God to figure this out. 
And God says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. That's her only mistake. In fact, the Bible clearly says that she was deceived. And God did not argue with that. That's why immediately He turns to the serpent. Okay? So now the thing is, is she is deceived in this. But Adam, willingly, knowing better, he's not deceived. He doesn't even claim to be deceived. And the fall comes in. And because of that, in fact, that's why the Bible says, because this is what's interesting, the Bible says by one man sin entered into the world. So God actually ultimately held him responsible. Now, getting into that part there, let's go a little further with what it says here, because we want to get into redemption. How does God restore all of this back? So as we go down, um, and now, of course, he curses the ground for Adam's sake for what he did, thorns and thistles it will bring forth. Uh, in the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat all the days of your life. Uh, but let's go to verse 16. Verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That is so messed up in English. I'll tell you why. For one, he says in Hebrew, you will turn to your husband. She had her own relationship with God. She was filled with the Holy Ghost. Just like women today, when women are filled with the Holy Ghost, you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Just like Eve had in the beginning. That's what redemption did for you. It restored your relationship with God the same as it did for a man. Where men and women fell equally. Although God put the, the, the burden on Adam, you know, by you know, putting, the accusation, putting the blame on him, nonetheless, Christ still had to come to redeem us. Now, the thing is, God knew all this was going to happen in the first place. That was, that was why Eve was inside of her husband to begin with, because God knew that he was going to send his son, come down on this earth, and inside of him was going to be his wife. You were going to be inside of God. So in that case there, God considers both men and women, women in His sight, because we are the bride of Christ. We're no different. We're no better. That's why there's no difference in God's sight about this. So what does He do? All right. So let's see. We were reading here. Okay. Greatly multiply thy sorrow. Let me take you to the Hebrew on this so you can understand this a little bit better. The word sorrow is, correct, is correctly translated. And that was verse 16, 3. But when you get, um, for example, when he says you shall, you shall bring forth children. Get here to chapter 3. Okay. Verse 16. El Haisha Amar. And he said to the woman... Harabah, harabah, which that does mean, when you, we have the same word repeated twice, it is put an emphasis on it. I will greatly. It's a vunecha, vecharanecha. Now the word vecharanecha is not childbearing. Teladai is to bear a child. But what does this word here mean? See, it is, God is saying to her that you are going to bring forth Sons, he doesn't even say children, he says, Teladim Banim, you're going to birth sons and it's going to cause you great pain and sorrow. God is literally prophesying to Eve all the things that are going to happen. Just like he started off by prophesying to the serpent that he's going to put enmity, which is hatred, between the woman and between him, between the woman's seed and his, and his seed. Everything, God is, everything's prophetic. I mean, how do we take it out of context by switching it out of pro prophecy? You see, God is prophesying to Adam and Eve and the serpent here that there is a fall that's taken place. He says that he prophesies of the coming of Christ, that he will bruise, you know, you will bruise his heel, he will bruise your head. We know that's a prophecy of Christ. We know that the seed is, the woman's seed is actually speaking of Christ. How is it her seed? 
In order for God to restore everything back the way it was before the fall, he's got, everything has got to be fixed. The mistake that Eve made was reasoning with God's word. That has to be fixed. The way to the tree of life was cut off. It's got to be fixed. All right? So if, if Eve reasoned with God's word, and then God promised that he was going to bring redemption into the world, and we know by the prophets and stuff as you read through in Isaiah, the child would be born, etc., then how does God bring that redemption in? All right? So what does he do? God starts off, and we have Abraham that comes along. As I told you, Abraham was being tried to see if he is willing to offer the sacrifice. God's already starting this whole plan of redemption. He's testing Abraham to see, will he be willing to offer up the sacrifice, the promised Messiah, as a sacrifice? That's his part that he's got to deal with. And he comes to Sarah. He wants to see if she's able to believe. So when the three strangers that come down, and by the way, in Hebrew, one of them, Moses spells it yod heh vav -Hey, which is God's divine name. Hashem, as we say, the Jews say Hashem. And just so you know, the reason why we don't say God's divine name is because we don't know how to pronounce it. And I know some people say, well, it's Yahweh or, or, or this or that and everything. Well, in Zephaniah, he promised that he would restore a pure language to be able to call upon his divine name. And it will happen when Israel is compassed with armies and about to be annihilated. So it is coming, but no matter how close we think we are, it must not be exactly right because God's already said when he would restore his name. That's the whole purpose for that. Anyway, so what does he do here, though? God is taking, he comes to Sarah. Three of the angels come down. This is where it breaks the kosher laws for what my people think are the right kosher laws because Abraham runs out there, he gets a calf, has a calf killed, gets the milk and everything and serves it to God, and God eats it and drinks it. So we know that kosher law has nothing to do with us eating the milk or drinking milk and eating a calf sandwich at the same time, because that's not what it meant. Anyway, it had to do with a, a paganistic tradition. We won't get into that, though. So, but he, Sarah, when he says to them, I'm going to bring you back to the time of life, just paraphrasing this for the sake of time, and you're going to have a child. And Sarah, in the tent behind them, laughs and says, how can this be? Now, don't think they didn't know about what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve and God had promised a seed. So the thing was, the fact that there was going to come forth a promised seed, they should know. But Sarah doesn't pass the test. And here's the funny thing, neither did Abraham. Not the test about offering up a son. He did pass that test. But he laughs as well. And the reason we know who God really ultimately blames is by the naming of the child. God has them name their son Yitzchak. He didn't name him She Laughs. He named him He Laughs. So just like he did with Adam and Eve, Adam took the brunt of the blame, and again, Abraham takes the brunt of the blame. But Sarah does not restore the word of God the way it's supposed to be restored. But when we move down in time, then we come up to this little young maiden named Mary. And God comes, sends the angel to her and says, you're going to be with a child. And she said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Where Eve made the mistake all those years before, finally it was corrected. There was no question about it. She believed God for what he said. And that brought forth the child. So now that part is corrected. Now Adam, though, remember, he was lonely. God had to make a helpmate. By the way, the word helpmate, Ezer, Kanegedo, or Kanegedo, has nothing to do with subordination either. Only one time does God call a woman a helper, Ezer. In Hebrew, all the other places in the Bible, it refers to God himself. Now, I'm not trying to elevate women above men. Don't, that's not the point. But it's also to get us to understand that just because we're bigger than them doesn't make them less. In fact, in the fall, when God comes to Eve and he says, he says in Hebrew, he literally says to her, you will turn to your husband. Shows that she did have, even though she loved her husband, she had her own relationship with God. And then he says, he prophesies, and he will rule over you. 
because they've lost the Holy Ghost. How else could it be? Now, I know a lot of times because people will say, well, you know, well, Paul, he says over there in the New Testament and everything, I told that woman to keep her mouth shut and not to talk in the church. Glory to God. Well, if you know what it says in Greek, he never says for all the women to keep their mouth shut. He actually says in the original Greek, I suffer not that woman to teach or to usurp any authority over a man. There was one woman trying to bring the doctrine of Diana in. And in that ancient Greek, it's actually written with a, with a margin in the main text. And they're asking him questions, and they sit in the margin of the lines that he writes in that ancient Greek, the way it's done, called Koine Greek. And we find out that Paul never said that. But through patriarchal teaching, they've always tried to suppress. Keep it down, keep it down, keep it down. They don't want the women to speak. And everyone that you run into, you'll find that it's that way. The book of Hebrews, or let me use Junia. Junius is what we read in the, in the Christian Bible. Up until 400, let's see, was it 400 or 500? Maybe it was some, around 400, uh, in, in after, 400 years after the, the resurrection of Yeshua, it was written in every Bible, Junia, the apostle, the, the apostle that Paul thought so highly of. It was a girl called an apostle. But a lot of people don't know that. The book of Hebrews was not written by Paul, totally contrary to his own writings, the way he writes his style. It's also believed that it was, uh, I always get them mixed up, Priscilla and Aquila, but it was her that wrote it. And that's actually documented in history. But they suppress that too. So now I can tell you from the Hebraic side because I know Hebrew. I'm not the good, good, good in Koine Greek, but I do know the Hebrew. And I can clearly see that that wasn't the way it was. God never intended it. But the fall caused a patriarchal society. But look at Jesus. Jesus did everything contrary to what we would consider the laws of God against women. He was for them. And he never pressed them down. Redemption is supposed to restore back that love and relationship between men and women, the relationship between God. So when Adam was put into that deep sleep, as we see in the, in the Garden of Eden, it was showing that God himself, or Christ himself, was going to come, and he was also going to be put into a deep sleep. In this case, he was going to die on the cross, and as Adam's side was opened up on the side so that God could bring forth his bride, Christ's side was opened up as well so that he could bring forth his own bride. Remember the little woman at the well when Jesus met her? And it was an uncustomary thing for, for him to be speaking to her. See, there again, there goes all of our theology out the door. Jesus broke all of those rules. But he's speaking to this woman at the well. And he says to her, bring me a drink. And she says, it's not customary for you to ask me such a thing. She says, besides you're a Jew, I'm, I'm a Samaritan. And so they get into an ecclesiastical debate, or at least she tries to get in one with him about how they should worship God, etc. And then he, he tells her something very interesting. He says, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink. And I'll give you water. You don't have to come back here anymore. And she said, the well is deep, sir, and you don't have any way to get the water. She says, how, how would I get this water? What was he, he, was taught, he was giving her a sign to look for. He was showing her the sign that God gave through Moses back in the wilderness journey when the children of Israel first came out. And two weeks into the journey, they're thirsting to death and they're ready to stone Moses and they're questioning whether or not God is even with them or not. And so what does, what, what does God tell Moses? Take the elders of Israel with you. Take your rod. And don't confuse it. 38 years later, God tells him to speak to the rock. The first time, though, he doesn't tell him to speak to the rock. And God says, I will go and stand on that rock. And you take and bring the elders of Israel out and you smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. He was talking about Christ. He was showing Israel the way God was going to restore eternal life. In fact, it's called the waters of life came from the rock. And when the rock was struck, the rock split and the water gushed out of that rock. And when Christ was struck on Calvary, 
In fact, if you ever try, Rabbi Singer, I know you're listening, so I'll remind he, he likes this one on the debates. He loves to take a Christian and really he defeats them. When, the, when they take Zechariah and said they look upon him who, whom that was pierced and they will weep and mourn as a family lost their only son. They're talking about actually the redemption of Israel that's fixing to happen. And of course, Rabbi Singer will take and tell the people, he says, it doesn't say pierced in Hebrew, it says thrust through. And I, I said, he's right. It does. It says thrust through. Because a Roman soldier, after he was pierced, took his spear, stuck it in, in Jesus' side, Yeshua, and ripped it open. And when he did, water and blood came out, and the water was separated from his blood. You know why? He wanted you to know this is the rock. Here the water of life is coming from it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. When the rock was struck in the wilderness journey, the life came out of the rock. The water came out of the rock. And as, I don't care how much they complained, as long as they drank that water, they lived. If they didn't drink the water, they would have died. You see? And so the thing was, was when Yeshua, like Adam, was put into a deep sleep, his side was opened up and his bride was taken out of his side, represented by that water coming out. And the life was restored. But Israel still refused to see, except the little remnant. I had a, a, a pastor down in uh, Florida the other day. He was a Presbyterian. And he asked me, he wanted to speak to me privately. And he said, I read your book. Somebody give me one of your books. He said, and then I read the other book that you wrote. And he says, I don't agree with my own colleagues. He said, they believe in replacement theology. He said, but after reading what you wrote, I know now that God does not believe in replacement theology. And he says, and I do believe that God is going to redeem Israel. But he said, I've got one question for you. He says, what did Paul mean when he said, all Israel is going to be saved? He said, you mean, he said all the one that got over there now is going to be saved? All of those are going to be redeemed? I said, no, sir. He said, then what does that scripture mean? All Israel shall be saved. I said, the remnant of Jews from every age. That is all Israel. Just like when they say that those that say they're Jews and not and they're not. That's why we have a bunch of crooked politicians in Israel. We got some good ones. We do have some, not all of them are bad. But the whole thing is, is their eyes have been held blind except for a few of us, like myself, that God allowed us to see early. That's why when you see John speak about a number that no man can number, they're made up of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. See, even the bride is made up of Jews. Remember when David, when he, I told you a little bit earlier, and we'll close here in just a second. David takes him when he's coming out, <clears throat> he's coming out uh, because he doesn't want to fight against Absalom, and he takes and he leaves behind ten concubines. Do you know that's a type of the bride of Christ? Sure is. You have written in the Christian Bible there's ten virgins. Five are wise and five are foolish. A concubine is the common law wife. In other words, what is it really? She just hasn't had a marriage ceremony. She's not had a proper marriage. And what did Absalom do? He abused them. But David, when he was going out, he left him behind. He says, care for my house while I'm gone. And though they may abuse the Christian, he asked you to care for them. Because, see, they don't get it. They don't see. And God loved you so much, he was willing to hold their sight back. And don't think that the last 2,000 years, I've got a lot of people that have come to me and they say, well, Steve, you know, all the Jews, if they don't accept Jesus Christ, they all went to hell that died. I said, how could you say you support Israel and think they all went to hell? Do you not know the story of Joseph when his own brothers, they sell Joseph out? I said, do you know the law of Moses about the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat? That's exactly what's there. Joseph was the scapegoat. He bore the sins of his brothers far from him. And the sacrificial goat was the one that they killed and put the blood on his coat. They meant it for evil. But God accepted the blood of that goat that they sacrificed for their sins. Had he not, we would have nine tribes missing today. Because God would have been obligated to kill every one of them according to his law. 
but he didn't. Same thing with Jesus. When they were willing to crucify him and they cried out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. They meant it for evil, but he meant it for their life. And he applied that blood upon them. That's why Yeshua was able from the cross to say, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Now you know why the fifth seal in Revelation says they were crying out, How long, O Lord, till you avenge our blood? It's not Christian martyrs either. Every Christian martyr that ever went down never cried for vengeance. Stephen was the first one, and the Bible said, like Jesus, he cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When you read the, the history of the Fox's Book of Martyrs and everything, the Christians that were all murdered for, this, for the name of Jesus Christ, they were, they, many testimonies said that they were singing hymns, and some of them said they were asking God to forgive their enemies. Christians don't cry for vengeance, but Jews do. They do. Because they don't know no better yet. They've not been converted. Anyhow, um, we'll close this part here because I don't want to keep you. Does anybody have any questions or anything?